Uh, I'm Janine Klein. I'm a child of uh, Holocaust survivors. Both of my parents survived Auschwitz, and I was born after the war. Um, none of my parents' family survived. They were the only ones. Um, so I never knew my grandparents or cousins or, you know, any close family. Thank you, Ufdu, and I did introduction. Okay, like Judith told you, um, I divide my speech in two parts. I tell you first about myself, how I survived <coughs> the war, and then I'll tell you about my husband. I do this on purpose to show you where we were at this. We were with the same people, the Nazis, at the same time but in different places. And how, sorry, how different, how different our life shaped up, shaped up. I just told you I was born in Vienna, Austria. And with, my father had a business in Vienna and in Sofia, Bulgaria. I hope you heard about Bulgaria, because sometimes I go to schools and they never heard about Bulgaria. Bulgaria is all the way to the east in Europe. And, um, they're Slavs, like the Russians, and they, we had the Cyrillic alphabet. Uh, Bulgaria was a poor country. It had to give you just a little background so you understand so how it was. And the population was 9 million. And they were, um, half of the population was illiterate before the, so the Second World War II. As time went on, we were commuting back and forth between Sofia and Vienna, just by sheer luck in 1938, when Hitler marched in and annexed, or the Anschluss, which it was called, uh, Austria to the, uh, to the German Reich. We were in Bulgaria, so that's the way I survived the war. At that time, we were Austrian citizens, and when Hitler marched in and annexed Austria, we became German citizens, and I still see it. Um, we got the German passport, and we got a big uh, swastika on it, and a big J for you there. And every Jewish woman was Sarah, and every Jewish man was Israel. So the passport was Sarah for my mother and Sarah for me, you know. I have a purpose why I said it about the passport, you, you know. Um, life was simple in Bulgaria. I went to a German private school. I had a very happy life there. Simple, you know, Sofia was the big city, had only one uh, four-year college. You wanted to be a doctor, an engineer, you had to go out of the country. So when we went to the doctors, depending what foreign language we, he spoke, we know where we went, we went uh, which country he, he got his medical deg degree. Life was simple and happy, really. I adjusted very well. I learned the language, which is not an easy language because it's a really the alphabet, completely different. But 1938, 1939, and 40, what was going on in the West? We didn't know. There was no communication. Hardly anybody had a radio, a telephone was a luxury. We didn't know. But letters came from family, from aunts and uncles that were I'm going on a vacation, which that means they were deported. But I don't know when I'll write to you again, but we still didn't know what was going on. Bulgaria, I grew up under a king. It was King Boris III. He had German ancestors, and Hitler needed, absolutely needed Bulgaria as a strategic point to march his, their troops through Bulgaria, through the Black Sea, to attack Russia. After much negotiation with the king, in March of 1941, the German, well, after German, marched into Bulgaria. And to appease the king, uh, Germany gave them, you know, uh, Macedonia, part of Yugoslavia it was, and part of Greece, Thrace, to annex to Bulgaria. 
things started to change overnight for me, for everyone. I was in the German school. I was the only Jewish girl in the class and was a Jewish boy. The swastika started to fly every morning before school. We had to line up there, the swastika was up, and we had to sing the famous German song, Horst Wessel Lied, that I still remember, unfortunate, still today. Um, the teachers came in with the swastika on their arm at Heidelberg. Things were very, very uncomfortable for me. Even the kids that I went to, to, to um, kindergarten, started kindergarten, but didn't talk to me anymore. I was Jewish. I was different all, all of a sudden. Um, I had to finish school. It was March. And in the summer, um, at that time, already there was a quota. It means only 7% of Jewish kids could go into a public school. Me coming from a private school, I had no chance to get into a public school. So we found a Catholic French school that accepted the kids. Things started to change for us slowly. Uh, we had um, to report to the police station. If you had a radio and telephone, we had to hand it over. But everything was going very smooth, smooth uh, quiet and slow. The Germans were not in charge of us somehow because we were. Um, we were not conquered by the Germans, we were allies. So the Germans gave orders to the Bulgarian police and they followed, followed through. My father lost the business, everything. Jews could not own businesses, doctor couldn't work in hospital. Everything was fine. It was very uncomfortable life. life. There was curfew already. After six o'clock, no Jews could be on the, on the street. On the street. We were, uh, coupons were all given. Well, it was enough to eat, but just barely to survive, but we had en enough. And I was always with my parents. It was 1942, in March of 42, it was the famous Wannensee conference, where they had established the final solution, which was Auschwitz and Treblinka. Things started to change even more for us. We liked to get left to one. Only kids with IDs to go to school could leave in the morning and have to be back. Um, uh, we, we had to report to the police every six weeks or four weeks, that my parents, or, of course. Or of course. Um, in, in November of 1942, see how slow everything was moving? And I always show this. There's a purpose to it. In, in the West, that's how big was the yellow star. It was a big yellow star, and depends where you were, it was Jude for Germany, Jewy for France, and they had to wear it here in the back. Our yellow star, it was known, was the smallest in Europe. Yes. <coughs> the smallest in Europe. It was a little button, as you can see on the bottom, and we had to sew it on on the left-hand side, and we had to wear it all the time, the time. It was, uh, the only good part I remember when I, I was at the French, uh, French uh, school, the nuns, there were nuns, we had to take our yellow star off because they felt we should be equal. And then they made sure that we put it on because we didn't want to, to, to be caught with it. At that time also, at the same time, it is in the Cyrillic alphabet, so I feel you'll have to bear for me that Cyrillic. The sign went up, this means entrance to Jews is forbidden. That's, as you can see, it's you know, it's in the Cyrillic alphabet, so it's very hard. That sign went up on every hotel, every restaurant, every movie, and any big building, even streets. We were not allowed to go in big streets. In the small streets where we were allowed, we had to go on this, not in the sidewalk, on the, on the street. At the same time, Hitler gave orders 
that were 4,000, only 4,000 foreign Jews, that was us too, they had to be transported. He didn't want any foreign Jews in Bulgaria. They didn't know if you were, had a Romanian passport, they put you on the Romanian border, Greek border, if you had. Now we had German passports, where are we going to go? We were not going to go to the West. So the few thousand Jews, they built boats and they wanted to ship them to Palestine. I still don't know until today, maybe my parents never told me how we were not deported. It was, again, a luck. I had a very German name, maybe they felt we are not Jewish, but we never got to know this, even if we had that German passport with the swastika and the J on it, but they did not deport us and we never know, know this. Until today, and my parents never told me, maybe they knew somebody, but many of our friends were deported. Unfortunately, some of the boats never made it to Palestine. One was torpedoed in the Black Sea, just by mistake by the Russians. Another one, it was overcrowded, sank. The third boat made it to Palestine, in Palestine. It was quiet and we didn't know, but there were always new orders, new things, old things you give it. We were scared even to walk in the streets if we didn't have to or had to go to, to school. It was March of 1943 when Hitler sent one of his best envoys, who supposedly did a terrific job, according to Hitler, in France, 1942, where they deported most French Jews. Um, it was Hoffman and Damnecker. Hitler needed 20,000 Jews for slave labor. The king agreed to it and rounded up 12,000 for Macedonia and and trace, and 8,000 from the border line, you know, of Bulgaria. They were picked up uh, late uh, during the night and put, it was January, February, about that time, put in big tobacco warehouses. Bulgaria was the big export of tobacco warehouses. <coughs> After much negotiation with the king, of course, many politicians, and the church. The church was Eastern Orthodox, Greek Orthodox, you know, the big popes with the big white crosses, crosses, went to the king and said, don't send them because they knew if they send them, most of them wouldn't come back. After much negotiation, the king agreed to let the 8,000 that were from the borderline that were really Bulgarian citizens, the rest were not, to go. They left on cattle cars to Long. Long was the border on the Black Sea, uh, on the Danube. They went with ships to Vienna. The Gestapo was very disappointed because they were not in good health and they couldn't use them for slave labor. So they shipped them straight to Treblinka. And out of 12,000 Jews, only 196 survived. We knew it was quiet, that something will fall now, because Hoffman and Damnicker were still there. I remember my parents were quite scared. They watched the news, whether they knew what we knew. It was, Sofia itself had 25,000 Jews. So according to the politics, they decided to deport the 25,000 Jews into small villages, make ghetto, and from there slowly transport us to the west, to the west because the cattle cars were still waiting for us. I remember it was a Friday. We got to know this. The police came and they said, um, we have until Monday morning, so 48 hours, to pack one suitcase, 50 kilo, kilo, uh, kilograms, that means 25 pounds, um, and we have to be ready to be picked up by the police on Monday. We didn't know, although they know this thing, it's small town, Karnobad, never heard of it. We don't know, will we go early to that town, or will we ship to cattle cars? It was quite a terrible, 
we didn't know, first of all, I thought maybe we could hide somewhere, but where we going to go. And the 48 hours was a lot of commotion and a lot of heartache at the house. It was Monday morning, it was May 27, 26, the day before the first transport left Sofia, but we didn't know where. We were sent, we were went to early to the train, the train station. It was a real train, it wasn't. I remember, I still see it, the train was there, and there were a lot of people with the yellow star. It was a long train from Sofia to the Black Sea. And there was the Gestapo. That's the first and last time I really saw the Gestapo. They were fierce. They were there standing with the big German shepherds and screaming and yelling the boss and the bosses around. And my mother told them, I remember telling me, my parents, don't open your mouth, don't. They should know you're not German, because then it's dangerous. And don't, the Gestapo, you are not allowed to look into their eyes. I remember only looking at their boots, and that all I remember, they were quite shiny, that all I remember. And I remember my I didn't understand at that time why my, why my parents were so worried and upset, because they looked for ID. Our ID was the German passport. And I know if they caught us with the German passport, they never would let us on that plane, on that plane. Again, luck was it, the, uh, the British ba uh, Air Force was based in Turkey, and they took off, the sirens went off to the British are coming. They had to get the train off the track, every train off the track as fast as possible. They got us on the train fast without checking our ID. I remember my mother started to cry in the train. I still didn't. Now looking back, of course, I understand. I didn't understand why. Because I said, aren't you happy if we're on a real train, not on a... No, no, you don't know. Anyway, we came to Karnobat. Karnovod was a small town, not far from the Turkish border, and was had stood a lot of still a minaret that chimed three times a day for prayer and um, the Turkish bath. When we got there, the, the police didn't know what to do with us because we were the first. The only thing they had given orders that the schools had to be cleaned out and. We had straw mattresses and there was a kitchen. We stayed there quite long until a few more came in from Sofia. Then they built, they got us into a, there was this very, very small Jewish community. And they packed us into some of these houses. We got a small, small room um, with three families in it. Three, three families in the small room. There was no, um, plumbing and no and no water. No, no, we had no no water. Now that I think back, and they did not fence us in the way you have seen of things. But believe me, we knew our boundaries. We couldn't go nowhere past that and that street. That was it. We had strict curfew. We only had two hours a day freedom. That means from ten to twelve. We, um, my mother went out to see if she can get anything to eat or change. She changed things with other people or something. She sold a blouse for a loaf of bread or, you know, it was, was tough going. Um, my job was to go to the well to get two buckets of water so we have some drinking water, some water to wash. Um, the police, uh, the government was very kind to us. And once a month, once a month, we could go to the Turkish bath to have a bath. But besides, we, we survived with, without it. Um, things were very tough. First, many, many, many nights, I went to bed hungry, not knowing if there's anything to eat tomorrow, and not knowing what will happen tomorrow. There were always different orders. Many times, they took the two hours of freedom away. The coupons were getting less and less. One day, I remember the police came and they said, pack your suitcases, the trains are ready for you. The next day they came and they said, 
the partisans blew up some of the train station. In the meantime, the king passed away. And even the historians after today, today don't understand. Uh, he was called to Bertha's Garden, which was the Hitler's headquarters, uh, some resort. And Hitler wanted the Jews, the Jews for labor, and he wanted also the Bulgarians should give him the soldiers. They were starting to lose the war. Stalin had already fallen. The, the, the uh, Brit uh, Americans also, the D-Day wa was, but the, the, tra the trains were still bombing for, for Hitler. And the, the, the king said, I'm not giving you the Jews and I'm not giving you the soldiers against the, the Russian, um, against the Russian army. Three weeks later, the king was dead, and nobody knows what happened. The, the prince was only six years old, so they had three regents put in to govern, and all of them were very sympathetic to the Jews. And trust me, we knew that we would be handed over to the Germans very soon. But as luck comes in, I was liberated very early. September 9, 1944, the, uh, Russians marched in, moved in through the Black Sea into Bulgaria, and I was liberated by that. We could go back to Sofia. Our house where we lived was bombed. Sofia was bombed a lot. Uh, my father couldn't start the business again. Things were not easy. You know, we had to recover. I had to go. The, now the communists took over. They closed all private schools. I went to a public school. I had lost two years of schooling, so I had to be taught um, mostly math, chemistry, uh, the sciences, and I must have had a very good science teacher because I became a chemist in my life, later in life. Life wasn't too pleasant anymore in Sofia, Sofia but I finished high school and my parents immigrated to Israel. And I went back to Vienna knowing the language. I had an uncle who survived Auschwitz to study chemistry. I look back many times of, of my youth. Of course, I, I have very much love for Bulgaria because I spent my, some happy years there. Here. And uh, in all fairness, the 50,000 Jews survived. It wasn't the most pleasant things, but we all survived. And my fear always was to be, just not to be separated from my parents. And I always felt, as long as I'm with my parents, I'll be, be safe, and I, I was safe. I went back many times to Bulgaria to show my kids and my sons where I grew up, and because the Bulgarians were somehow good, and the 50,000 Jews that lived survived. I always feel that Bulgaria never get the accolade, like Denmark that survived the Jews, because there were a few reasons. First of all, they still gave out 12,000, and so few only came back. And also, um, it was the Cold War, and there were very good allies of the Russians, so nobody wanted to touch them. I will go west now, to Poland, to Lodz. Lodz was the second biggest city in Poland after Warsaw. It was a big industrial city, mostly textile. It was called the, the Polish Manchester. And the Germans renamed it Litzmannstadt. Lodz had almost 200,000 Jews. Big, big Jewish community. My husband came from a big family. He had a four-year-old brother, six-year-old sister, a lot of cousins and nephews, uh, I mean, aunts and uncles, grandparents on both sides. September 3rd, 1939, Hitler marched into Poland. By September 9th, they were in Lodz. And he said, overnight, things changed. Like slow they were going for me, as fast they were going for him. He was 10 years old at that time. 
and the brother 14 and the sister 16. 16. Overnight things changed. Overnight kids couldn't go to public school. The father lost the business. Only three or four weeks later, the big yellow star was issued. He had to wear it in the front and the back, and it said Jit. That's for Polish, Jew, Jews. Uh, everything went fast, very fast. April 30th, 1940, the Lodge Ghetto was established. You must have heard of the Warsaw Ghetto, which was famous with the uprising. But the Lodge Ghetto was big too. There were 20 to 20, 200 to 150,000 Jews uh, uh, in that ghetto. They were packed in, 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 in every, every corner. He was 10 years old. He worked in a tannery to make belts for the German soldiers. He worked from 8 in the morning to 5. If he did, you didn't work, you didn't get a loaf of bread. His parents or grandparents couldn't work, so he had to share the loaf of bread with them. The lunchtime, they got a little potato soup. He would say, yeah, there were more potato peels than the soup. He would always say, the, po the severe Polish winter and the malnutrition, the people were dying out right and left. His grandparents and his parents, slowly aunt and uncle, although some of them moved to Warsaw, to the Warsaw Ghetto, they felt it would be more safe there, but it didn't, of course. <coughs> he, he said life was, was severe there. Uh, after the uh, tannery, he worked in a woodworking shop where they had big planks of wood in there to cut them, you know, um, whatever they, they needed in. It was August of 1944. See, I was almost liberated. They started to liberate, to, to close the ghetto because the Russians were moving in both of They put them on cattle cars on a transport. They didn't know where they were going. And if you were on a transport and a cattle with the cattle cars, which they packed in with the jeans, um, it didn't matter if you were 24, 48 hours, 36, you had no water and no bread. That's all you got is bread. When the first transport left Lodge and came back to the cattle cars, there were signs there, try to save yourself, you're going to hell. But how, do you, how can you save yourself? The, my husband, his brother and sister, they were the last one on the last transport that they went. Um, one okay. When the train stopped, when the train stopped, the Gestapo was ready there with the big um, German um, German uh, dogs and yelling around around. The first sign they saw was. Arbeit macht frei, that means Auschwitz. Uh, work makes you free. But because it was, Auschwitz was overcrowded, it was, uh, Auschwitz was overcrowded, there were too many people that were coming in, they shipped them to Birkenau. Birkenau was really original, the children's camp, well, only the children's, but because it was so crowded. So Birkenau looked like this. See, that's the train station that your teacher was talking. This, the train was going through here, and here was the Gestapo standing there and waiting, waiting thing. At Birkenau, the women were put set separate and the, the men on the other side. So they separated. Now, my husband was now almost 14, 18, 20. His sister on one side, and he and his brother on, on the other side. That's the last time he saw his sister. He never, never, to his dying day, found out whatever happened to her. No, he, he, we couldn't find out or, or anything. In Auschwitz, you didn't stay long. First of all, there was the first examination. You can go to labor, or you go to the 
showers, the showers were nothing else than cyanide, and turned to the, to the, to the, to the oven. He always said that he, he never, until he died, Dave, he never forgot the scream, the yelling of people, and the burning of, of, the, of, the, of the flesh of human be beings. The brothers were together for a short time, and every day there was a commando coming to look you over for labor, if you needed you to, for labor. Him being 14 and short, because he didn't grow, of course wasn't picked for labor, the brother was late. He always felt that if, as long as he's with his brother, he'll survive. But one day another commando came, so they picked both brothers for, for later to, to go for work. When you got to work, the one thing he always said, the Germans were so kind, they gave us the striped uniforms and the wooden shoes, and they put your number on it. There was a reason for the number. First of all, that you mean you're a slave to the, to, to the Third Reich, and also you can't escape, you can't escape. When they were giving up, when he was lining up to be tattooed for the number, the guy looked at him and said, you, they picked you for the work, you in the last day. He always felt that was the end again, again. But the brother already got the, the number. The brother got the number. So the other German said, give it to him. He wouldn't last anyway. His number was B, B for Birkenau, 3, 10, 308, the brother was 307. They were put on a cattle car again, not knowing where they were going, but they were going west to Rodontau, which was a coal mine. He being short, that's why they needed him, he would go down in the shaft with, with dynamite to explode the, the, the coal. But the brother had to really, there was no elevator, there was nothing, so they had to carry the heavy, heavy coals up there. They stayed there until March, until March 45, 1945. Five. He said it was time to go because the brother already was spinning up the black dust, like, you know, from the coal mines. They put them on cattle cars again, and they, they, were, they were more than 48 hours because the trains weren't going and they didn't know where they were going. But then they saw they crossed the Austrian border and they went to Mauthausen, which was another <coughs> tough camp. There was a quarry and they had to go up 77 steps and come down with the heavy limestones. And he said that many people gave up. And then one day his story was a man, mean German commander separated the two brothers. I think for him that was the hardest time. He was put on a train and his brother waved his last goodbye to him. Of course the train wasn't going far, so they had to have the, for the dead march, where they were marching. You had to march if you couldn't. He even teamed up with a cousin, but he couldn't, um, couldn't make it anymore, so they were shot on the spot. On April 30th, they, they slept on the um, wet ground outside. Um, they woke up and the German soldiers were gone. Whoever could walk or crawl, they went up to the highway, and it was the 5th American Infantry Division that liberated them. At that time, my husband weighed 51 pounds. He was put in a lazarette, which was the named for a German hospital. He was there for months, for months, malnutrition to build him up, and depression, knowing that he's the only survivor of, the, of his big, big family. He went then to a DP camp, which was the displaced person camp, and then to America. He came to an orphanage to New York, an orphanage in Chicago, and then a family in Providence, Foster took him in as foster parents. He, um, he went, finished high school. Of course, he lost a lot of time of high school, finished much later than not. And then he was drafted in the Korean War. 
and after the Korea, he didn't go to Korea, he was lucky because he knew languages, so they needed him in the intelligence service to serve it. But after the, after the war, um, after the Korean War, he got the GI Bill and came to Europe to, stu to study. He became a chemist, a chemist too, and we met in Europe, of course. Um, and we came back here, and we both made a life for ourselves. He would always say, you have to make a life for yourself. You can't give up, because then the German won. We can't. We're still here. Many times he would say, there must have been a hand that guided me through all this misery. So I should be here and tell my story. And we really, we really tried to make a normal life, even for my children. But the memory of Auschwitz and all his bad times were always there with him. I remember one time we, we were on a high room on one of the local streets outside of Prague then. It was October and a rainy cold day and he had to go and change the flat tire, flat tire we had, I don't know, Triple A couldn't come. When he came back, he was all drained and cold and he said, oh, it reminds me of Auschwitz. And we stood for hours and hours in that pouring rain and to, 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 to uh, wait for the commandos to come. See, everything reminded him. I could give him a potato soup, if there was a potato peel in there again, another story came. But we tried to make a normal life and have a normal life to ourselves. When he spoke in school and when I, he always finished his speech to say, enjoy life, enjoy, and do the best, because you'll never know what life will be in the future. And we hope that the future is a better future for all of us. Thank you very much.